Two tickets to Wales, please, mate. To make place, Wales? You what? Where about would you like to go to in Wales? Look, I just want two tickets to Wales. That'll do. Won the pools. No, the bingo. Yeah, but where about do you want to go to? Benlec Mountain. We don't have any stations at the top of mountains, Don. Well, they're near the station to it, then. Look, I just sell tickets. I'm not a geography teacher. Where about do you want to go to, lad? Wales. Hello. Do you remember the summer of 1983? I do. So do you. And that's why you're here, I think, because you saw Willie Russell's landmark TV drama One Summer, maybe on the upstairs portable, and it stayed with you. My name is Matthew Sweet. I'm a writer and a broadcaster. And this is the One Summer reunion done to mark Network's brand new restoration of the series on Blu-ray and also to raise funds for the Liverpool Everyman and Playhouse Theatres. And this event is a collaboration between all of these entities. We're streaming now on Network's YouTube channel and the Liverpool and Everyman Playhouse Theatres Twitter and Facebook channels. And you can submit questions to us by following the instructions on the, the bar that is flowing beneath me uh, uh, now. You can use the hashtag uh, one summer. And if you go to uh, the uh, um, if you go to the, uh, the the Facebook page, then you can do it uh, that way as well. Streamyard.com slash Facebook. You can get your comments to us uh, through there. Uh, and also, this is a night of, of total virtue, this, because not only are you being encouraged to, to donate uh, to uh, the Liverpool um, Everyman and Playhouse Theatres, you are also um, encouraged to buy a copy of the ne network Blu-ray. Uh, and some proportion of that um, will also find its way to those theatres as well. So you can't go wrong morally tonight, I feel. Um, we have two uh, stars uh, waiting in the digital wings here, um, uh, you know, they're not wearing their school uniforms, uh, but they are, you know, they're, they're ready to talk to us. And they are, of course, Spencer Lee and David Morrissey. David Morrissey, very familiar and well-loved actor, star of, uh, of stage and screen. His Bradley Headstone, his Blackpool, um, his Gordon Brown, and most recently his Singapore Grip on ITV. Spencer Lee, a co collaborator of Derek Jarman on Caravaggio and The Last of England. He spent mo most of his career now behind the camera making award-winning documentaries and music videos. His work has been screened at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, but I think uh, we need to talk to them uh, quite soon. And so let's run the clip and see them in their natural habitat all those years ago. Here they are. It's Billy and Icky, David Morrissey and Spencer Lee. Welcome. Hello. You Hello. changed a bit. Um, you can see why I never took up a singing career from that clip. Though. Oh, come on. No, you, <laughs> you did well there, I thought. And you had good running, too. Oh, my um, run. <laughs> it's good to have you connected up uh, tonight to to see all this material with us and to, to to celebrate this work which means so much i know to so to so many people as i think we're going to uh, to talk about but i wonder if we could begin by talking about in a way the reason why we're all here this uh, this fundraising effort for these theaters which have both played a, a big part in both your lives spencer oh god you know where do we start you know one summer just very very proud to be part of it Great to work with Dave and Ian. Obviously, James Hazeldean, no longer with us, wonderful actor. Talked Dave and I a lot. I think we were by, at the time, you know, pretty, very impressed to be working with him and also slightly in awe. And Gordon Fleming, no longer with us. So, yeah, very grateful for the whole thing, really, and happy that it's had this life beyond mm. just being a TV show. This is a story, though, that I suppose begins in 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 that the, in the world of youth theatre in Liverpool, though, David. This is where you both started, and, and in a way, uh, a place from where this story arose. Well, that's where I started. Yeah, I mean, I found the Everyman Youth Theatre via, you know, uh, 
school, I did a little bit of plays in school, but uh, when I got to my secondary school, they didn't do any drama. So I did this thing where every adult I met, I'd say, hi, my name is David and I want to be an actor. <laughs> and because I grew up in Liverpool, because we grew up in Liverpool, it's, uh, I've been very thankful that it's a city that's always taken the arts seriously. So nobody really laughed at me when I said that. They just went, oh, okay, you know, why aren't you in a band, really? Yeah. <laughs> but eventually one of those adults said, oh, have you, have you been to the Everyman Theatre? They've got a youth theatre. And I went and took myself along there and I walked through the door and my life changed. I, I found my tribe. I was about 14. And I walked into this little room full of people doing imp uh, you know, improvisations and readings. And it was really a magical place and really changed my life and was aligned to the Everyman Theatre. Uh, which also was a very vibrant place, had people in there like, you know, when I was there, there was, you know, John Sessions, who passed away recently, was in mm -hmm. the company, and it was, it was run by Ken Campbell. So it was a really yeah. anarchic, wonderful place. And I was bitten, and that was it for me from then on. And uh, I wanted to be an actor from then on. And then one summer happened, and it, they... They sort of, it seemed to me, I don't know about Spencer, but it seemed to me that they saw every young man in Liverpool from the ages of, you know, 13 to 25 or something. It, my first auditions were like Miss World. You know, you walked in, you had a number, <laughs> and then they said, okay, 5, 10, 57, you stay, the rest of you can go. And then from then on, we had various interviews and screen tests mm -hmm. until they said, okay, let's go. About five auditions, Dave. I remember it being a long process. It wasn't just go in and you've got the job. It was, you know, several and lots of different people. You'd be out, I forget where it was. Was it in like the hotel or somewhere, Dave? I can't even remember exactly. It was in the Adelphi. In the Adelphi, okay, yeah. It was in the Adelphi Hotel. I'd never been in the Adelphi Hotel. I'd heard the great stories about, you know, Bob Dylan staying there and Paul McCartney when he came home stayed at the Adelphi. But I'd never been in. And I went in and it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was it was falling to bits, but uh, that's where we met, and uh, we met all the different casting directors, and then the director. So, Spencer, did you did you know uh, some of the other boys who were up for these parts then? I knew a few people. I mean, I was also in the youth theatre and being in a play, Alan Bleasdale play, No More Sitting on the Old School Bench. Similar thing to Dave. Went in the was a friend of mine who was a new a writer called Guy Chambers, writes songs. His mother knew somebody who writes songs for Robbie Williams, I should say, write, writes, written a few big songs. And his mum knew one of the actresses in the company, and he said to me, hey, Spence, why don't you come along to this youth theatre? Went along, same as Dave, I was like, wow, these are my people. And, you know, you're living in Liverpool, there's not a lot going on bar some of the wrong things. And um, I was just... Couldn't wait to go to that Everyman New Theatre. And, you know, and then to get into a play at the main house was a huge thing for me. Do you remember meeting each other or uh, in those auditions, David? You know what? I don't, uh, my memory is we didn't meet each other in those auditions. My memory is we met each other once we'd been cast. I saw, we've sort of knew each other in the, in the scene, you know, I certainly knew no more sitting on the old school bench, although it happened before I'd arrived at the Everyman. Um, but, you know, we it's sort of met each other when we got the job. Yeah, there was, a, so there was, there was definitely minglings of people. And, and like you mentioned, Ken Campbell, you know, he was doing this crazy theatre stuff, the war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, so it, was, it was an interesting place to be. And, you know, very, very inspiring for any young person. And how did it feel to be awarded these? I mean, they're really big parts. This you're, it's a it's a long, big series. You're in almost every scene. Was it was it daunting, David, when the when this script was presented to you? I had yes, it was daunting. But I was I was you know in the arrogance of youth, I was slightly okay. Uh, of course, they're going to cast me. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a very. Um, and I nearly didn't do it. I mean, I was offered it, and that was fantastic. And then I thought, I'm not going to do this. Why? Gonna... Why? Well, I I thought at the time I was very, you know, the theatre was everything. We were in the theatre. Well, that's what we were doing. And the idea of television. And also it was on this new channel. It was on this mm. brand new channel called Channel 4. 
And um, I was slightly wary of that. And But, uh, you know, when I say I wasn't going to do it, I did think for, I had to, like with every big decision in my life, I t I, there's five minutes where I think I'm just going to walk away from this because <laughs> I'm too nervous. And if I decide that it's my choice not to do it, then, you know, I can give in to my nerves and do that. But it was daunting. But I have to say, everybody involved, from the minute I got in uh, to the casting director's makeup, costume, all the crew, spent, they made Spencer and I feel totally welcome. Mm -hmm. And the atmosphere they created was one of real uh, love and appreciation. And, you know, we, there was nothing intimidating about the job once we took it on. Did you have these misgivings, Spencer? You know, did you not want to sell out so young by by appearing on commercial <laughs> television? I think what David just has got on, you know, a happy crew is a winning crew. And you know, when you're given a big role like this, of course we're nervous, but the atmosphere was really, really good. All the people were lovely. And I'm really grateful for that. It wasn't as once we got started, you know, bar working with Jimmy for a moment was a little bit, oh, we're working with a serious thespian here. Mm. Whereas Dave and I, it didn't really take us that long, I don't think, Dave, to get in the groove. I think we learned mm. our minds and Gordon would say to us, stand here, do this, and we'd try it out. And, it, you know, often worked. Did you understand I mean, we, these we, characters straight away, David? Do you know, did you know who these boys were? Were they you to some extent? No, they weren't me. I knew people like them, but I wasn't in, you know, I wasn't in a gang. I wasn't in any, you know, that wasn't sort of my life. I'd certainly grown up in a working class environment, but I hadn't grown up uh, like Billy had, you know, I wasn't from a broken home in any way like that. Um, but I knew people like it. That world was at my fingertips. It was around, it was certainly, you know, we filmed in my city. It was about people in my city. They were recognizable. And Willie Russell, who wrote it, sort of knew those people as we did. But it wasn't my life. But um, I didn't have to, you know, do a lot of research to find the characters. Um, but I, I, um, I, I responded to the fact that, you know, when Spencer was talking just then about being in an, an atmosphere with James Hazeldean, he was a big actor for us. He was, he was like proper. But the minute we did, we Spencer and I sort of worked for about maybe two or three weeks without any actors, just him and I on my own, our own. And when Jimmy came in, it was very intimidating for about five minutes, and then he was just so lovely and encouraging, and and you know, professional. He brought the best out of us, definitely. Mm -hmm. Gave us that confidence, and um, yeah, he was a special man, really lovely man. So that moment when he appears in the series as a, as a kind of initially a rather intimidating figure was mirrored in your your actual relationship with him then. Mm -hmm. And looking back at it now, I mean, you see the characters are not you know might have not had any obvious overlap with your with your own circumstances. But Spencer, when you look at it now, what does it capture about you as a teenager? Because it must capture something of of how you were at that moment. It's so really all. Fun. It's really, really hard looking. I watched it this weekend with my son and my ex-partner, his mother, Angela. And um, it was really hard watching it because it's like, who is this person on the screen? You know, but it was just, there was things I didn't like about it, but that's just one. And, um, well, you know, you've got to let that out the way. And that was, what? How, when was it on summer 1983? It's a long, long time ago, and what I know now, I probably wouldn't have done a certain amount of things. I felt like at times it was a little bit, my character was a little bit ham. Acting could have been a little bit brought down, but in general, I, um, no, I loved being in One Summer, and I felt I related to the character, um, and the character, and knew a lot of people in that kind of world. And um, so it wasn't, like Dave said, it wasn't that hard to relate to. I think we should see another clip uh, from the series, one that shows a kind of moment of intimacy, really, between Billy and Icky. So let's have the clip, uh, please, uh, that's called um, If I Could Be Anyone, I'd Be You. <laughs> no once. It's with Louie and Rabbit and that, all right. We say who we'd most like to be in the world. You know, they all said footballers and singers. When it come to my turn, I told them, 
If I could be anyone else in the world, I'd be Kenny Daglish. But I was lying. Because if I could be anyone else in the world, I'd be you. But sometimes I fucking hate you, Billy. Icky. Icky, come on, we can. Fuck off. So good, isn't it? So clever. What do you make of that looking at that now, David? What I remember is um, scenes like that, they really threw me because th there was uh, there was an honesty of emotion between two people who weren't used to that type of dialogue. They weren't used to that sort of being open with each other. And it's sort of what they'd learned from their journey. That one boy was escaping something and escaping into nature and escaping into another life. He had to get, he had to get away. And Nicky was his friend and came with him, but he didn't want that life. There was nothing, there was nothing there for him. He wanted to be back in the city, in his own city that he loved. And so you saw a friendship needing to part at that point and the pull that they had over each other, they protected each other, even though it looked like Billy protected Nicky, but they were, they were there for each other. And Willie's always been wonderful at expressing that type of love and affection between people who don't normally express it. Uh, and that scene, I remember reading that scene and thinking, how are we going to do this? Because it's, you know, there's, a, there's something in it that they've changed. The dynamic has changed. Billy is the person who's front-footed. He's the one who's leading it. He's got the action, the energy and the action. And Icky is following. And suddenly in that scene, it changes. And Icky takes control of his own life. And it's a beautifully written scene. And uh, I was very worried about, there was lots of scenes I was worried about how we were going to do when we got there, but Gordon guided us very well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that one summer really taught me very quickly as an actor was that you tell the story out of order. You ne you're never doing it as you would in the theater chronologically. So you have to know where you are in the story all the time. And I think that particular scene for us as actors came, you know, it didn't come in its sequence. It came further into the, our working life than in the story's life. So you had to make up a lot of things that you hadn't even shot. And mm -hmm. Gordon was wonderful at guiding you in that way. What have you been doing? What was the scene before this? Where are you going? Even though you hadn't shot those scenes, keeping you on message. And it was a, it's a lesson I've learned through my life as an actor of staying, you know, even though you're out of continuity, knowing where you've been all the time. And that's, uh, he really taught me that. That was only one of the lessons he taught me, but he was a, he was a wonderful director. Spencer, how confident were you about handling the complexities of, of this relationships that, that, that's depicted here? Well, it's a really, really is a complicated relationship. And obviously there's this protection thing going on. There's, um, you know, I really feel Icky did look up to Billy. And then as we, as we saw in that last scene, but there is a moment where it just changes. And it, it is a beautifully written scene. And um, I like the way cinematically it's just that straight on locked off shot mm -hmm. that, is, you know, I don't want to sound like too much of a cinephile, but, you know, it's almost like, I was going to say Tarkovsky or one of those people that the camera just stays there and you see what's going on. And I think that's really brave. And you knew it, but he had it, Dave and I as actors, as those things were going on. And I think that allowed him to do that. So... Pretty amazing. I mean, I just watching that, I, I really felt the impact of the scene. Mm. It was powerful. I mean, it was easier for me to watch that as one scene than watch the whole thing. <laughs> but also, I think what Willie is wonderful at is, you know, you talk about did we relate to the characters? And of course, you can relate to their social circumstances or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the emotional relation, you know, I did have friends where I was at school and, you know, we were all good mates. And then I wanted to be an actor. And something happened that I just had to sort of get away from those relationships. It wasn't design or anything. It wasn't turning my back on anything. It was just the way that my life was panning out, that I was more concentrated on this part of my life that was starting. What I see when I watch the program in both of us 
is two young men who are not fully formed but about to go into a different part of adulthood. They're about to discover things about themselves, mm -hmm. not just sex and drugs and rock and roll, but about their emotional side as well. And you see them at a point in their life, and I see obviously see myself as this as well, where you're just starting to step into this adult world. And there's a vulnerability in that. There's a hard-facedness in that. There's, there's then the arrogance. But there's also a real, a real sense of discovery. They're still discovering. They're not jaded in any way. And that's what I love about them. They're on the cusp of that adulthood that we, you know, that we're all sadly very far down the line <laughs> in right now. But there is, you see that in our bodies. You see it in our faces and our expressions. And, I, you know, that's not... There's no acting there. That's us. That's the casting, I think. Mm -hmm. Spencer, what do you remember about what about Willie Russell's attitude to to all of this? Because I don't know how much you were you, you were let in on at, uh, at the time about this, but he thought you were both a bit. He he when he wrote it, he envisaged it being played by actors who were who were younger, who were really in the who were really I suppose fifteen or sixteen, something like that. And you were, I think, eighteen and nineteen, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Willie, unfortunately, and I can say this now as time's gone by, wasn't really involved, which I, I found a real shame for me because I was a huge Willie Russell fan. Mm -hmm. I'd seen Stags and Hens at the Liverpool Everyman and new actors that were in the original Blood Brothers. You know, and it, he was sort of an Alan Bleasdale growing up in Liverpool and I'd seen Our Day Out. Willie was a real big thing for me. So mm -hmm. I was kind of a little bit sad when Willie Russell wasn't involved in it, but you shake things off and you get on with them and Gordon was leading the ship and, you know, he was the captain and Dave and I were on board for the ride. So it was sad and, you know, I'm glad Willie has since put his name back on the project and understands its merits. It may have not been his choices, but, you know, there are things that weren't really, I wasn't involved in. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was devastated by it. I was right. really, uh, I mean, I was such, like Spencer said, I was a huge fan of his. And, you know, to be even considered to be in a Willie Russell piece mm -hmm. at that time for me was just like, you know, being picked for Liverpool or something. I was like, that's what I want. <laughs> and um, so when all that happened, I was really broken by it and confused by it. I didn't know what I took. I did take that person. Mm -hmm. And there was lots of rumors about it that, you know, there was certain actors he wanted or whatever. And I had to really, as Spencer did, as, as all of us in the piece had to do, we had to just go, we're here, we have to do a job, we're here to do a job, let's get on. And I, after the job finished, I did confront him and, and ask him about why. And he, you know, he was very generous and said, look, it wasn't, it's not personal. It was just my vision. I wanted to do something. And that was it. Um, but now, when I watch it now, you know, I that first episode, there's something of the Ken Loach about the way that um, Gordon um, approaches that that's, uh, sequence. It's very different in the, the other episodes, but in the urban stuff, you know, there's stuff in there that's very, you know, the, the camera's miles away mm -hmm. sort of in, in the real world. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm very proud of that. But it, I was knocked by it. I was really knocked by Willie sort of, because you want to please him. You know, mm. you want to please this man who is your, your hero. And uh, I'm, like Spencer said, I'm so glad he's come back to it. And also that I have a, a good friendship with him or have, have developed a friendship with him after, afterwards. I'm sort of surprised in a way that you weren't protected from all of that, um, that, that, uh, that it, you know, it, it actually came back to you. I almost uh, imagined, uh, you know, that, that you wouldn't be told about it. But while you're making it, you have this as a sort of a bit of a burden or a bit of an anxiety that, that well, he's... You have his name on the script at the beginning, I do believe, mm. you know? I mean, you're like, we're going to be in this Willie Russell thing. So any kid from Liverpool is interested in drama. It's like hitting the jackpot. You're going to be in a Willie Russell TV show, you know, insanely, you know, it gives me shivers now thinking about it. And I have great admiration for the man. I've never, I've, I've never actually spoken to him, Dave. I'd love to speak to him at some stage. And yeah, I've had long conversations with him about that and other stuff. But I think, you know, Liverpool is a village. You know, it's a great city, but it is a village. So uh, keep something, a like, 
something like that is going to get back to you very quickly, you know. So, and where we hung out, you know, Spencer and I, whenever we weren't filming, we would ha hang out in by the Everyman Hope Street. You know, we would hang out in that little sort of bohemian quarter of Liverpool. So the rumors were rife that oh, we didn't want you, you know, we didn't want you, and, and you know, and every time, it, and every time someone said he didn't want you, they'd mention a different actor. So I was like, okay, <laughs> not any of the ones who's at, who were actually in it. Wow. Yeah, so I was just waiting for them. He didn't want you. He wanted Robert De Niro, you know. <laughs> so, but it was all that, um, you know, it was, you had to, but again, one of the things I learned and one of the things you have to learn, isn't it? You know, you have to grow a thick skin, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you have to, whenever you're working, there's always rumors that you, they wanted someone else. Every job I've done, they've wanted someone else. Always someone better, Dave. <laughs> I wouldn't say better. <laughs> More expensive, I would say. I'm the best in my price range, as I like to say. <laughs> and what, what, looking at it now, what do you think it conveys about the Liverpool of the period? Well, you know, Liverpool was going through a real change. I think, you know, when you see it from an architectural point of view, that's one of the big things for me watching it, the first episode, is all those places where I hung out, they're not there anymore. Mm. You know, so there's a great there's a great picture I have of Spencer and I on a roof just by Lime Street Station. And whenever I get to Lime Street Station, even though I've been there so many times since then, I walk out, I look for that building and it's gone. <laughs> so, you know, that the city really did change massively and, and needed to change, you know, architecturally quite yeah. quite considerably. And it did. And then, you know, obviously the city of culture happened and there's a lot of money went into the city as it still is happening now, uh, particularly around places like Albert Dock and stuff. That was all happening whilst we were there. You know, there was the garden center was happening. Then the, the redevelopment oh, of the Albert Dock. This, it, was, <laughs> it was Thatcher's Britain, you know, it was being kicked to bits at that point. So what I see of it from a Liverpool point of view is how the city has has triumphed over the adversity that was being not sent at it all the time. You know, it, it, Thatcher would have been happy for that city to just, you know, float off into the Irish Sea. So, but now what I see is, and, and I've seen over the years, is a thriving city. But the heart of it is still there. That's why I was saying before about coming from a city that is take, takes the art seriously. You know, I was so happy and proud to have been in a city where the Walker Art Gallery is there. You've got two great theatres there. You've got all the music, which we don't have to talk about. But people talk, you know, they talk about the arts. They are culturally sort of savvy all the time. And that's been such a great thing for me all my life to carry with me. Yeah, likewise, Dave. You know, the Liverpool poet scene, the Roger mm. McGough, Adrian Henry, Brian Patton. You know, this, you know, it's got incredible artistic heritage, Liverpool. And then obviously, you know, when people say, well, oh, a city's depressed and it's got economic problems, always wonderful cultural things happen. People are creative, yeah. you know, writers are creative, people make stuff happen. You know, and I, I love that kind of punk rock ethos. I felt like I was at the heart of a cultural world. I really did. You know, this was a point in the, certainly from a musical point of view, you had, you know, Teardrop Explode, you had Echo and the Bunny Man, you know, you had, uh, as Spencer said, you had the poets, the theatres were doing great things. You had Alan Bleasdale, you had Willie Russell, you know, you had great, great things happening in the city. And it felt very vibrant, even though economically it was struggling. We had really you know, uh, big in Japan, you know, all those stuff. It was just happening. It was really a, a, a really happening place, I thought. Yeah, it wasn't We're going to let the people who are, who are... Go ahead, Spencer. No, it's just I, 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 I concur with Dave on everything he's, he, he's said. And I, oh, the other, other thing I do agree with you, it did have a real Lochian feel, that first episode mm. with the one lens. And I, and I said that to my kid. I said, this is amazing. It's like a Ken Loach thing. <laughs> and then it turned into a different thing, but that's another story. Yes, as a record of as a record of urban poverty at that moment, it's pretty strong and precise, isn't it? The the that that flat where Billy lived, Billy and his family live. You know, we get to see every every kind of threadbare detail of that environment, don't we, David? We do. Um, you know, and I think I've always been a bit worried about that, about that sort of looking at that sort of 
poverty side of any city and stuff. But what I think you see is uh, characters who have a fortitude and an intelligence. And okay, they might not have an academic edu education, but they've certainly got an emotional education happening. They certainly have emotional intelligence happening around the, the, the city. And um, and I think that comes across. You know, there's there's a real um, there's a real joy and and uh, um, sort of wit that happens with any willy piece i think and mm -hmm. uh you know uh, all his writing has that about it and, and and i was very proud to be part of that we need to let people in quite soon to to okay. ask their questions of you but i'm curious to to hear you talk about about the in a way the reason why everybody is is kind of gathered here in this form the impact that it made and the way that it stayed with those viewers who saw it. How have you been sensitive to that, uh, Spencer, maybe at the time and also in the intervening years? Well, just, you know, I mean, the script's got a lot of pathos. I think that's the right word to use. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's had a huge impact. People relate to one summer. I know it's very different and it's easy to, um, Compare it to other dramas at the time. Obviously, Alan Bleasdale would be easy to say that, you know. But yeah, I guess because you know the Bleasdale thing was from Liverpool. But um, it's had a massive impact, and there is a reason, and it emotionally resonates with people. One summer, and it's that story of you know trying to improve yourself and not really having the opportunity and having the support system. And that's a great universal story, isn't it, that Willie tells many, many times. And it's about having the opportunity. I know Dave talks a little bit about actors not getting young actors, working class actors getting the opportunity now. And it's the same story. Here we go again. But there we were in the 80s. And what did, what, what did people say to you about it, David? What, because those characters really struck a chord, didn't they, with many, many people. Oh, yeah, it was, and also, I mean, even now, you know, when I go home to Liverpool, people say, "All right, Billy," to me, you know. <laughs> really? And uh, but also, generationally, people, you know, people watch it. People had it on DVD; they would watch it. They'd have it on old, you know, VHS and watch it. Their kids would watch it, you know. So, I, people approach me about it a lot. But also, you know, television was different. The content was different. So you, you know, it was the launch of a fourth channel. God, you know, how was that? <laughs> Before we'd only had three channels and one of them was BBC Two. You know, so we never watched that. So it was <laughs> it was about this thing of a fourth channel. It, it felt like a real rock and roll channel as well, as well. It was launched in a way that it was a channel for us. It was going to be in musically, culturally, it was a younger channel. It was a younger yeah, voice. Right. Yeah, right. and so yeah. we were part of that young voice, you know. And remember, you know, Brookside was coming on to Channel Four as well. So mm -hmm. they they had a they had a they were kicking down boundaries Channel Four at that time, and we were part of that wave. And I think people really uh, it meant something because it reflected people like us. You know, people were watching it and seeing themselves in a way, and seeing this wonderful story being told with about people that they could see outside their window sometimes yeah they connect to the characters well of course as we're uh, partly the reason why we're here is that we can now all see it again kind of beautifully restored from its original film elements um on blu-ray and a proportion of every uh, uh of the price of every blu-ray sold will go to the uh, to the young everyman playhouse so this might be the moment actually to get the uh to, to get the some of the questions in there was one that has been uh was sent in um i think this is a a tweet that comes from uh the uh, the writer andrew mail which i think in a way has already been answered let's get the screen caption up and we can see uh we can see andrew's question and i think also david your your reply to it yes what does so, he say? Uh, uh, well he he asks um about what billy <laughs> would be doing now and you have answered. He became a music music. journalist. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd be writing really long pieces about Echo and the Bunny Men, would he? Is that what he'd be doing? Well, he might be, or he'd probably be <laughs> sitting at home, sort of bemoaning his lot and yeah. thinking, "Oh, every, everyone's a music journalist these days, aren't they?" That's what he'd be saying. And uh, I'm going to bring out a book any minute now about my two, two minutes I spent with the, uh, you know, Ian McCulloch one night. That's what he'd be doing. <laughs> 
<laughs> do you think do you think about his future though and what he what he might have become yeah i mean i do i mean obviously you know his his immediate future was not great you know he got sacrificed there you know he sort of for he had to sort of you know you see him going off at the end and it's you know he's not going to have a great time at the moment i mean his future is decided by that moment mm -hmm. i think what willie does is he presents for both of them uh, a different future that they could have that is snatched mm -hmm. away from them yeah, and it is about that sense of can you escape your past uh, yeah. in a way but i um and you know we see the events that happen at the beginning of the se the, the, the series and then we see the domino effect of what happens to them as the season goes on and they there's a something happens and he can't get away from it he can't run far enough billy because uh, it will always drag him back. Yeah, uh, there's no future. No. And Peter, uh, but I, th I, think, I think he would, you know, I would like to think that he would rise above all that. Peter Harvey asked uh, uh, via Twitter, he says, I watched one summer on Channel 4 in 1983. It troubled my teens. Did they really feed a Mars bar to baby birds? <laughs> <laughs> um, and another, another questioner, <laughs> <laughs> BT asks, I want to know if the baby birds were real. Those of those people who, who are here would have seen the uh, who've seen the series already will know the tragic scene to which we refer. But come on, tell us were, were any birds harmed in the making of one summer? No, they were robotic. <laughs> robotic. <laughs> they were robotic, and I'm actually happy with the new transfer because it's a lot better and you um don't realize. <laughs> <laughs> That was such a palaver. It was a real palaver. We, we, we did have real birds for one shot, and then <laughs> they get transferred, and they're, they're sort of little robotic things. And we, but we had to feed them um, this Mars bar because they were robotic. They couldn't swallow it. So it was just sticking on these beaks and stuff. But, and we were killing ourselves laughing, and we're not supposed to. So that was quite thing. But oh, when I see it, one of the things that I remember, Spencer, I don't know about you, is just we ran up and down those mm. hills for weeks i mean just we i'm sure they were laughing at us but gordon would say you know go off and run down that valley and then run back up this hill and it felt like we were doing it was like we were on some sort of triathlon or something you know, we were, you know we had the energy crazy. and um yeah. i agree with you i think gordon was having a bit of a laugh with us and i think you know until you're talking about this stanislavski approaching the scene i think he was trying to work out a bit there he was, he was. Gordon, Gordon Fleming when he directed uh, Doctor Who and the Daleks in the 60s he used to give Roberta Tovey a shilling every time she did something in one take and he, <laughs> he called a one take Tovey did you were you bribed in this way as well no I don't remember him bribing me in any way no no, no, no bribery of Gordon. I yeah. was quite frightened of Gordon. I mean, I was frightened of him in a very positive, good way. You know, I would never have turned up late. He really taught me professionalism. Don't be late. Learn your lines. Know what you're doing. You know, he was. He wasn't That's like right. you know a headmaster, but he was. He was teaching us how the TV craft. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, Kate Caitlin Emerson asks, what is your fondest memory of filming with James Hazeldean? I would say this, the scene where, with Billy and Icky is my favourite scene, the reading sequence, when we're all in it together. Seemed very good energy. It was funny. It was serious. It was loving. I think it hit all Willie's tropes. David? Yeah, the whole experience for me, he became a very close friend of mine and uh, and sort of, you know, a bit of a mentor figure. He was the person I would go to all the time whenever I was, you know, nervous about myself in a job or, or whatever. He was he was a real touchstone, not just for me, but for many actors. You know, I was t uh, talking to Eddie Marzan recently and who'd done a play with him when he was young and he'd been there for him as well. And Mark Strong. You know, he was he was uh, an actor who really, you know, was there for a lot of people and a very generous man. So the whole experience for me, it, it, you know, doing the show changed my life, but meeting Jimmy and having that friendship changed certainly changed my life. Uh, from then on, he was uh, he was a very special person. 
And you know, what one of the great things for me about doing it with Jimmy was he wasn't patronizing in any way. There was never he never talked now. He treated us like proper grown up actors from mm -hmm. the minute he met us. And that was a real uh, a gift for me. Yeah, it was a smart decision on and he was he was incredibly generous and caring to Dave and I. Gave us the room, you know. I I did see him for him, you know, in the middle of teams working with Jimmy and he'd help you out. You know, you get on and do your thing, but he'd push you in the right direction if you didn't do the right thing. I'm just looking at the comments coming in. I'm seeing lots of uh, relief at the at the uh, uh, the uh, the idea that there were, there were no birds harmed in the making of one summer. Mm. I also at Spencer, a passport official who once uh, once fussed uh, around you in some funny way when you were entering the country in the late nineties, has just apologised for for holding you up. Don't know whether. They... <laughs> And lots of people just saying how what an impact um, this series had um, upon them. I mean, the, I'm just going through these comments now, and the and the and the love is uh, is pouring in. Um, uh, another questioner asked in the in the DVD commentary, you said you didn't smoke and had to pretend. Did you come out of the filming as smokers? I know that happened to my ex, says this poster, who was in a youth theatre group. And when, and when he was cast in an anti-smoking community service ad, he had to puff through packets of them and came out hooked. Yeah, no, I didn't. I mean, we did smoke a lot in the job, but I didn't, I didn't end up smoking. But, uh, yeah, I had to learn how to do it, really, because it's sort of... You know, it wasn't a natural thing for me. But some of the other actors smoked, um, you know, so th th I sort of sat with them and, and watched them. I don't remember. You didn't smoke, did you, Spencer? Not there. <laughs> <laughs> no. I remember Spencer bought his first car on the job. He got a no, really? BW Beetle. Yeah, yeah. we drive and, to uh, the that, and I. <laughs> that was real fun. I remember that. Yeah, listening to craft work in the car, driving so down. Yeah. Is that, why, is that why it's you who drives the tractor, Spencer? <laughs> yeah, because I couldn't drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us about that tractor scene, because that is wild, uh, isn't it? I can almost, you are actually doing it. It looks pretty dangerous. I we think that's one of the it. first things we shot, wasn't it? I think it was. Yeah, we did do that scene. I mean, we had some, I mean, off the train, okay, showbiz talk here. There was guys that were our stunt doubles when we jumped mm -hmm. up, and Dave and I just did the roll into the scene type camera shot. And um, there was guys that were there to do the tractor stuff, but I had enough driving car skills at that time to do the tractor stuff, so it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it, it felt quite wild. You know, the guy was like, you've got to be careful. These things tipple over and all that kind of stuff. But um, it was fine. Yeah. So you weren't, you weren't alarmed by it? Because I was very alarmed watching it <laughs> again. Couldn't believe it. There was one bit where I was on the side and we were d d driving around. And I remember being thinking, oh, this, we're going to be fast here. But you just <laughs> get into it. I mean, you really do. My, the, 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 the worst thing was the train because... There's a swap out where we, the train is going along, we open the door, we're there, and then we go to jump, and then the stuntman comes in and jumps out. And I remember that being quite difficult to sort of, the swap was quite difficult. Yeah, the timing of it, I remember it had to be very specific. You couldn't mess up, obviously. You yeah. know, and I mean, the other thing, you know, one someone was shot in film, mm. and, um, you know, there was only so many takes. <laughs> you know, it's not like digital stuff now where people can, shoot and shoot and shoot you know it was like well i don't I, I remember two or three takes dave maximum and that was the other the peter jackson who was the dop he he really was somebody who i i sat with a lot mm. and i sort of he was very generous to spencer and i about how camera works and different lenses and stuff mm -hmm. like that we were very greedy for mm. information of how this worked above and beyond just learning your lines and getting on set and everybody was very generous with us about that you may have seen the tweet flash up on the screen here. Yes, MJ Simpson asked, did either of you keep something from the filming? And if so, what? Have you got any one summer souvenirs? I have, yeah. Do you have the book, Dave, the one summer book still? I, ha I have the book. So the book that Kidder writes for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And gives it, and, uh, gives it to us. 
they obviously had a few of them and they give us them at the end and i and spencer and i still have that yeah and everybody signed it i think didn't they <laughs> yeah nice um uh another question from uh from uh gary duncan no, I'm sorry. One from to from BT, um, and she or he asks: um, When I've been to Q and As of actors, musicians, etc., some of them say, "I don't want to talk about that. I did that years ago. I want to talk about current stuff." Was there a time when either of you wanted to leave one summer behind? I didn't want to leave one summer behind at all, but I did want to lose. I did want to leave Scouse lads behind. There was a point where all I got was Scouse lads. Mm -hmm. And there was always, you know, it was a bit scally sort of like performance written uh, characters. And I didn't want to do that. And I did one summer. And again, through James Hazeldean and his encouragement, I, I went to RADA. And then from RADA, I went to the RSC. And that, that was a really great piece of advice from Jimmy. He said, look, you can play Scouse lads for the rest of your life if you want but if you want a career and you want to sort of broaden your range then go to drama school and i did do that and i was very pleased about that spencer good advice um i had a i, I was getting work and was you know very went the completely opposite way and worked with derek jarman mm. um, which was completely different but really grateful that i had that opportunity completely different world i was offered a job um, I was offered several jobs, and, and and it was very weird at the time. Dave went off to RADA. I was offered a job by Carla Lane to be in a TV show of hers, and then, unfortunately, Equity, for reasoning that I still don't really understand at the time, said we didn't have, I didn't have enough experience. The producer had given me the job, and then it was taken away. And um, okay. I was a little bit upset by that. Mm. May have changed the course of my life a bit, but these things happen in life, and um, yeah, it was a strange, it was a very strange thing to happen because mm. I think we were capable. I thought I had enough TV experience, yeah. And then I went off and to get my equity card, I had to work in a pantomime and assistant stage manager, but you know, you do what you do. Paul Griffiths has a question on the screen here. Have you ever returned to the sites in Wales and Yorkshire where it was filmed? It was filmed. Uh, so in the Yorkshire stuff, we filmed um, just because it was uh, Yorkshire television. Mm. We were based in Leeds. We filmed some of it just outside there in Harrogate and stuff like that. I think the house was just a uh, uh, kid's house was up in Yorkshire. I did go to I did go back to Bala where we were where some of it was filmed Bala Lake and stuff. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I have been around to some of those locations again since certainly you know locations uh, in North Wales I've been quite often. So yeah, real stuff like that. Yes. Uh, and Charity Gale asks, how do you both feel about dealing with the topics of mental health, depression, and homosexuality? You can um, deal with those in any order you like. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, the great thing about Willie is he would always, he was such a challenging writer. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense that, um, you know, because of our friendship was so close, we were constantly being accused of homosexuality from the other members of the gang. There's a great actor called Sean McKee, who's sadly no longer with us either. Mm -hmm. He was the sort of the, the tough guy, and he would shout stuff at us all the time. But yeah. I thought that Spencer, I thought that Willie really dealt with that. That when we got to Kidder's uh, house and he'd been arrested and he'd been sort of rumors had been about him, I thought it was really an amazing piece of work mm -hmm. to sort of be confronting that at that 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 point, you know. What do you remember about yeah, that? I thought it was really Spencer, well about the... Did it cause? Do you remember it caused yeah, any yeah. discussion or, or debate those aspects of the story? I think later, later, later on, I think it became more. I, when I looked at the film, like to the, to the show later on, I saw those elements in it. But I, I, I agree with David again. You know, the handling of the writing. You know, these are two guys. Listen, you, you know, you have your best mates, and you are in love with them. It may not be a physical love, but there's a, you know, you're doing the same stuff together. And um, so I think there was that element in in one summer for sure. Mm. It was, just, and then obviously. 
the kid a story. But um, yeah, I, I you know, it's it's a very good question, and it's in, in, in you know, there's a lot in that question. But like I said before, you know, that what I loved about it was they were two people, two young men who were coming into adulthood. They were so what they mm. knew about the world was very limited. And their education, the, the world education, was, was happening in front of us. So they had real sort of entrenched attitudes towards things, which they were de being disabused of as they were going forward. And certainly with their friendship with this person mm. who was gay, who had been victimized, who was constantly oh, wow. being victimized because of it. And they saw him as an individual. And suddenly it, be it made sense to them in a different way that it hadn't before. And that coming of age story, I think, was what was so great about what uh, in Willie's writing. Jennifer Brewer is asking uh, about what was the funniest moment filming one summer. Perhaps we've already had it. Perhaps it's those birds, or the tractor, or or, or any number of moments. Spencer, what do you recall? Oh, there was a lot of I, I, there was a lot of funny scenes in in, in, in one summer. I, I think the plate scenes. It's a little bit silly and a bit ham, but it is rather funny. That this, you know, because Icky is a. I wasn't. I was going to use the word stupid, but he's you know, he's just missing the screw. There's something not quite there well with him, and to do that and to be bored. And I think it was a again, you know, it's a clever character thing by Willie that for the kid to go and do that to be bored and to throw the plates I mean I think that's quite pretty brilliant stuff brilliant writing really we laughed a lot I have to say I mean my favorite bit is where Jimmy sings a song and it's all this it's very sort of like you know it's this folky sort of lovely song uh, that he sings uh, and then Spencer says that's not singing Icky says that's not singing and then sings <laughs> House of Fun by Madness brilliantly <laughs> <laughs> and I remember being so knocked out by Spencer doing it, just standing up in, in this small little cottage because we did it on, on a, in a situ in location, and just went for it, and it was brilliant. And and that sort of cultural clash of this sort of lyrical sort of folk song to this brilliant sort of madness, uh, kicking down the houses, a house of fun stuff was just brilliant and uh, it blew me away on the day and it always blows me away when i watch it it's just a great performance thanks Dave. so Wirral guy who may be somebody called guy who lives on the Wirral for all night i know is asking <laughs> where was the scene with icky and the car smashing into the garden center filmed he always thought it might have been filmed near near him at, at, uh, at gordale nurseries in neston Any, anybody remember that no i just remember we went it was out of Liverpool. I take the tunnel out of Liverpool, and um, I can't remember the specific location. I'm sorry, we're all guy, but um, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> I hope it's not in Yorkshire. Is an answer that you're being satisfied. It's by. Definitely, yeah. Yes, no, it's, it's definitely yeah. northwest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Corinne Bath is asking about changes in acting style now. I mean, I don't know whether whether. Um, she's thinking about your personal acting styles or acting styles more generally as they, as they change over over the um, over the years. But what do those perform when you look at those performances now? Are you how are you evaluating them, David? Yeah, I mean, like all my performances, I'm really critical of it. But, um, you know, I have to remember, like Spencer said before, I have to remember who I was at that time. I didn't have a lot of experience as far as being on a film set is concerned. I think, you know, a good 70% of it I'm delighted with and then the, the rest of it I pick apart all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think, you know, there's a... The, the acting has changed. I think, it, you know, I think people are much more savvy about what you need to do on a film set, how it works, how what a camera does. I think we, we all, because of camera phones and stuff, we all know mm -hmm. what we look like on camera. We all know how to work on a camera. So it, that's transferred into our, into the profession, whereas I'd never seen myself. I mean, the, when I first saw it, and I saw myself run. I mean, I thought I run like you know, like a real athlete. I thought I ran like such, <laughs> you know, like I don't know, Sebastian Coe or something. And I watched it, and I, and I honestly, I, I looked like a monkey falling out of a tree, and I couldn't believe it because in my head, 
I thought I had this wonderful sort of Steve Austin, you know, mm. six million dollar man run, mm. and I don't at all. I never have. And so <laughs> to be, so that was quite strange. But and I and has everything changed now? Do you run differently now? I'm going to be watching yeah, out for I, this now. I, I, still, I still, still aspects of that run in me. I have to say, I, you know, that's why I always say that's the reason I didn't get James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> But I do think I think we are much we are all more used to looking at ourselves, mm. hearing ourselves, seeing ourselves. Mm. I had I had never sort of seen myself with such scrutiny as I did with one son. What about you, Spencer? As a director now, do you look at yourself more critically because well, of I'm that? the same with Dave. I was I was finding it hard. To, like I say, I watched it with my son. I was finding it very hard to watch it. But then there was bits that were really still pretty damn good like watching that scene and some of the stuff Dave said tonight and then you're like I get it I get it. I really do and I you know I'm, I'm very proud of one summer it would be always something that had great importance to me meeting Dave mm -hmm. um, Gordon being an amazing generous person James Hazel being the same and just Historically, looking back, like our friend Sean McKee, no longer with us, seeing Ian, a young Ian Hart. Ian Hart, yeah. You know, just, and it's, there's a lot of very, very strong elements that keep it together as, as, a, as a piece. And, um, yeah, you can always criticise, but something 40-odd years ago, you know, I think it holds up well, and I'll always be proud of it. I sense we're getting into that kind of concluding mood now, but there's one more question, and then I'll then I'll come back to you finally to ask about your feelings about the, the piece now more broadly. But Ange Harris Tanza asks, "Have you got any advice for young actors wanting to enter the profession today?" Yeah, I mean, you know, my thing now is that it is a profession that is welcome to all. I, we've sort of slightly because it's so difficult for a profession that when people enter it they need to be supported for quite a few years and they're usually supported by the bank of mum and dad so therefore it becomes <laughs> if so facto becomes a middle class profession and that's i i hate that and i think you know it's about making it you know uh, open to everybody i think that there is a there's opportunities for that i think it's a great job to do if people you know stick by it uh and I would say, don't try and be like anybody else. Be you. Mm -hmm. you know, the worst thing is when you see actors and they're trying to impersonate other actors. And I don't want that. I want to see who you are. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's my main thing. Spencer. Be yourself is very good advice. Be original. Have your own through line. And um, stick at it. If you really love something, stick at it. And... Do the best you can do, and uh, you know everyone should have an opportunity. I don't think what David said is correct, and it's not for just that people can't afford to be an actor. It's a, a real tragic thing for me. Well, as we as we come towards the end, it would be nice just to hear you reflect on you know what this means to you now. You've both watched it again recently. Um, it's a record of a moment in your lives. It's a record of the the beginnings of your careers. When you sit down and watch it now, what does it stir in you, David? Oh, just really happy memories. I mean, you know, it was a uh, it was the job that started me on the path I've taken. You know, it was the job that told me that uh, this was the world I wanted to spend the rest of my life in. It was the job of, uh, you know, walking onto a film set and seeing that there wasn't just actors. I mean, when I watched television, I didn't think of cameras. I didn't think of crew. I was just watching the actors. So to walk onto a film set and see all these people and the jobs that they did, and it sounds the cheesiest <laughs> thing in the world, but I felt at home. I felt more at home walking on a film set than I had anywhere else. And that was a real, uh, you know, for me from then on, I thought I want to be here. Mm. And uh, in a way I always want, that's where I want to be. And I had a great time. I made friends for life like Spencer, you know, it was an Ian Hart who I knew already, but we, you know, we really bonded on that. So it was, uh, 
it was a real seminal time for me and I look at it in with great gratitude uh, and, and real real love, real love. Spencer, I think you get the last word. I'm going to say it very simply. Film sets, if you ever get the chance, are magical places and magic happens on them. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you both very much indeed, Spencer Lee and David Morrissey, for being with us to celebrate the, the reappearance of one summer in the winter of 2020. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. And a reminder to everybody that you can that you can see this again if you want to kind of look at yourself in the school photograph twice. You can you can go to uh, the place where you're looking at it now in order to uh, watch it again. Um, that's um, uh, via the Twitter feeds of the the theatres or or on the the Facebook page. And uh, don't forget that you can buy a One Summer Now on Blu-ray and from Network. And and as you do that, you will be contributing to um, the Young Everyman Playhouse. Uh, and you can also uh, donate uh, anything you like to them. Um, uh, be be generous um and uh, thank you all very much for for joining us tonight um to to celebrate a remarkable piece of television which i know has a place um in all the hearts of all of us who are tuned into uh, this right now thank you all very much indeed thank, thank you. you thank you dave <laughs>